Hello, I'm sitting here in a beautiful building along the beautiful Rogue River, the land of my people, the Tequilma Indians. My name is Agnes Baker Pilgrim. Today's January the 23rd, 2018, and uh, I wanted to be able to talk to you a little bit about my life, a little bit about things as I grew up things that happened along the road. And I am sitting here today, I was born September the 11th, 1924, at a little burg called Logston, Oregon, way up by the headwaters of the Sletz River in Oregon, inland from Newport, Oregon. I'm a member of the Confederated Sl Tribes of Sletz. And the tribe long ago named me a living legend of the tribe. And uh, I'm very proud that they did that. And uh, I'm the oldest member that we know of, of the Tequilma Indians that lived here in Southern Oregon for over 22,000 years. So I think we're, I'm the last of those old people. And I live here because just north of Grants Pass, a jump off Joe Creek area, all my old people were born up there and I think they kind of kept me anchored here and that they guide me and help me from there, from where they are. And I believe that's the thing that kind of keeps me a going because I know that they kept me here to do different things throughout this land, you know, and help the animal kingdom and help take care of the water and be a voice for the voiceless and, and to spread this word around to everybody that it's our job as adults to take care of the, the land for all of those that are gonna be coming behind us. We need to do this. We need to stop the pollution in our rivers and streams. We need to stop the, the gases and stuff that's going up to the ozone layer. We've got a hold of the ozone layer. And uh, we've got smog in our cities, so that tells us we're not doing very good. There's pollution. I've been all over the world, and there's pollution in all the rivers and streams and oceans, and it's sad. And so I started the sacred salmon ceremony way back there in 1993 because spirit called me and told me i had to come over here and do this salmon ceremony and i i was living in crescent city california and i had an office over there and i told my god i said you got to give it to somebody over there i don't live over there well anyway that didn't work so i I went along here and i'm sitting here right now close to the the bridge that had all of this uh, uh, Savage Rabbit's Dam was piled high with garbage and I went down and walked around down there and I saw that things didn't look good with all the garbage behind that dam and, and I thought it's not good for anything and uh, I walked around around the shoreline and I saw that that uh, algae was building up and I thought oh, oh here comes uh, uh, it's going to start something else and uh, so, along, uh, so I'm trying to think what comes after algae uh, around the repairing zone. And so anyway, it was getting polluted. So I told them here that they need to do something about that dam, but it took a while for them to take that dam down. And it took 21 years to get them all off of the river. And I did salmon ceremonies. I had a lot of people following me when I came over finally to do the start the sacred salmon ceremonies. Uh, and I started over on um, the Applegate River out of Roosh, Oregon, a little south of the Applegate Dam in uh, 1993. And so my husband and I, he was a fisherman of the, of the Klamath River, full blood Yurok, and he had all our salmons, and we came over and set up camp. And the Star Ranger District over there get, led us to use 17 acres to do this. And to this day, I'm very proud that they helped us to get started. And so I started in, in 93, and uh, 
here come the state fish and game in 94. They said, Grandma, we don't know what you've done, but there's more fish in that river than we ever heard of. And I said, when you teach reciprocity, the Creator will bless. Which meant that at every salmon ceremony I had done, I had a sweat lodge put up as a spiritual banner. And I had young divers to go in there and do a purification sweat for one hour. And while they were in there, I had fish cooked to feed everybody there a taste of the salmon. Skin and bones they brought back to me, and I have a beautiful fish bowl that they put them in. So we gathered all, all of the skin and bones and had it there when the divers come out of this purification sweat with cedar boughs on their head, which is sacred to us also. And when they came up, I put the skin and bones on top of that. And so they, the drum would start and drum them to the river's edge. They would line up on the river. They too would stand and pray to Salmon Nation because my people believed that salmon looked like us two-legged, and they lived in beautiful cities below the ocean floor. And they chose every spring and every fall to change into salmon and swim upstream to feed us two-legged. So I used that to be able to start the salmon ceremony and to have people to come that lived along the bank of the river over there to tell them, let's, let's police the river, let's do a better job, let's stop the, the pollution in the water, because there's life in that water. The salmon are precious to us. And not only that, the animal kingdom needs to drink from its bank. And so all these many years, it took 21 years for all of the uh, dams to come down off of the rivers here, so that the salmon were running free for the first time in hundreds of years. So I feel that all the people that helped me do that, you're so special that I thank each and every one of you right now for your support in helping me to continue to get this done. So I pray that the message I have here today, even though I haven't done a salmon ceremony, that you will help me to police the rivers and streams. Just keep the garbage where it's supposed to be. Because years ago when my kids were little, I taught them they weren't to throw anything out my car window even. I said, that's your mother earth out there. She sustained us. She gives us all the clothes in our back, the car we ride in, our food, everything. So we got to treat her better because she takes care of us. So I taught that to my children a long time ago, not to be throwing garbage around. And if you get a ticket from throwing it out of your car, you these people in boats and ships should get a ticket to throw it out in the oceans like that because there's life out there. We got to protect all the animal kingdom and the water. We got to have good water. So do the animals because they're a part of our balance. We need them badly. So help us to take care of the animal kingdom, would you? Let's stop the pollution. Water is precious. Without water, we all die. How long do you think you could live without water? And do you know that I always tell my water inside, 75% of your body is water, that I love you, you're sacred, you're precious to my life. I can't live without you. Even when I shower, I, to this day, I always tell the water, bless me, inside and out, wash out all the baddies. And so even when I wash my hands, flush the toilet, wash the clothes, cook, wherever I use water, I'm always thanking the water. And to this day, I still, when I ride over a bridge, I bless the water. I love you, water. And I, and the rivers, I do that to the rivers. If I'm in an airplane looking out and I see the water, I bless the water. All over this world, I bless water. The rivers across the United States, up into Canada, clear up past the Yukon. I bless the Ottawa rivers. And so I, everywhere I've been, the Mediterranean, Clear down through Brazil and South America, over to Hawaii, all over Australia, New Zealand. Clear down through to Brazil and South America, Japan, Europe, and everywhere I've been, I teach people no life can live without water. Let's do a better job of taking care of it. Stop the pollution. Watch what you, what's going in the water. Stop the fracking too. I was taken to New York to have them to stop it over there. 
And so we got to watch out what we're doing. We're destroying our water. And if we destroy the water, we'll all die. You know, I have prophesied that this world will face a water war. I might not see it, but it's going to happen, I'm sure. Because never did I think I'd get this old and be, have to buy bottle and, uh, bottled water. And then when they go bottle it, put it in a crate and then they load it in a truck and then they take it into these stores and put them on the shelf how long do they sit there before you buy them and when you buy them is all the chemicals and everything in it that is good for us or does it leak out through the plastic you better think about it i have my water delivered right from mount shasta the great the bluish green grass jugs and i know i'm getting good water so Check your water. What, what's the best water for you? So always thank the water for your life because none of us can live very long, maybe three days, four days maybe. You know, it's pretty iffy. It's scary to me what I see coming. So I hope that you will talk to the water inside because I met Dr. Musa Moto. He came over here in 2002. He came to Ashland on his way. He had me up on his website. He wanted to know how I knew water could hear. So I told him how Spirit taught me that and told me to go be a voice for the voiceless, that I had to be a voice for the water because water could hear. And that my body got water in it to thank it for my life. And so I still do that to this day. And so Dr. Emoto gave me his, one of his books, that there's messages in water, beautiful stories about how different types of music and different types of words and how you can talk bad to water and a glass of water and it'll cloud up and then you could write on a piece of paper and stick it on that glass and say I love you and it'll clear up. Don't believe me, try it. And so they use different types of music, loud, real loud music, and then soft, beautiful music and how the difference was the, uh, of the water. So when you talk to your water that you love it and everything and then you freeze it, bring it back out, it looks like a beautiful piece of snowflake or a beautiful piece of lace. I never thought today to wear one of the medallions that Dr. Moto gave me. But anyway, I have them that he's done, but he's gone on now, but he done a great thing for the world. And so get his book, What the Bleep Do I Know? Or Messages in Water, take a look at him. You know, that we, none of us, no, no life can exist without water. Us as adults, you know, if we want our little kids, I have some little ones, three and, and uh, three and four year olds now, in my fifth generation, that I want them to be able to grow up and be gray headed like me and have good water and good air. And you should too, if you've got family, you know, even if you don't have family yet, it's your job to take care of your water and to thank it for your life every day. And so when I'm even in an airplane and I look out and I bless the water, no matter what country, whether I know the lake or river or whatever, I still bless the water. I'm always thanking it in here to bless me, take care of me, wash out all the baddies. You know, there's 7th Street Bridge. <clears throat> Going across, that goes across the river, the 6th Street Bridge, goes over the water. I never go across those bridges. I, even if I go over, I come back on the other side, I'm always looking down and blessing the Rogue River and thanking it for all that live in it and all that drink from its bank and praying that people will stop the pollution in that water. Help me to do that. You could do that. Don't be putting things in that water that don't belong there. It's our job to try to keep them alive. Because by that, it'll help us stay alive. You know, God honors us when we do things respectfully. And to help others, it's our job to take care of the animal kingdom. They too need good water, so help me with that. You could do that. So <clears throat> even the pets you have need good water. And so I, I work hard all over the world teaching people that water can hear. Talk to your water inside. Give it, thank it for when you drink it, when you wash your hands, where you cook, wash your clothes, flush the toilet, take a shower. You know, remember to thank the water. Every day I do that. I take the water wherever I use it and wherever I drive or wherever I fly over a land. I always thank the water. 
Can you talk about your grandfather and table rocks? Oh yeah, uh, the table rocks, you know, uh, the upper and lower table rocks are the, the, Tequilma, the Tequilma Indians and the Latgawas were the up at the other table rock, which they said was the poor Tequilma people. And in between was the first reservation here in Oregon. And uh, they had interviewed me over there sitting between those two big mountains. And I've been up on top three times. And I went up there one time and there was a big cloud and a big rain cloud above us. And the man said, if you run to over there and do your, we're gonna go over on the side of the mountain and do our prayers. And uh, he said, if you run over there and get it done, come back, you beat the shower. And so I said, I can't run. So anyway, I looked up at the water and told it, you know, it don't, you don't need to get us all wet and what we were going to do. And I prayed and thanked it though. And, and I walked over to where everybody was standing next to the cliff to, to do our prayers. After we got down, we all turned to come back and we looked up and there wasn't that cloud up there. So Creator heard our prayer and took it away. So that's proof too that your prayers work. And uh, so anyway, we never did get wet from up there. But we've been up there. When I first went up there, there was cattle up there. And they lit me, they flew me on a plane and landed me up there on an airplane. I have that film. And uh, there was a building up there and I went down and met these farmers down there at that ranch and told them that uh, they're destroying plant life up there and it should, they should be taken off of there. Well, eventually it did happen. They got them off of there. And, uh, but I've been over there several times at the reservation where that first one was and feeling the, the aura of my old people there and when they were driven out of there in 1856 north, they could only take one thing with them, and that was a little bag of food. So they, they walked 200 miles up to our tribe, and uh, they wore their moccasins off, their feet were sore. It was a sad time for the old ones to go, young and the old. Some of them fell, and they'd run back and, and uh, pick them up, and so the the cavalry said, don't do that anymore. We'll just leave them there for food for the animals. But they were respectful to the elders. If they failed, they ran to help them get up. But they wouldn't let them do that anymore. But it was a hard trip for my people. As I talk about it now, it hurts my heart to think what they went through to get up there. And then when they got there, the agents had used up a lot of their money. There wasn't enough food and bedding. Some of them died. It was sad. When they got there, later on, they elected my grandfather, Chief George Hardy, as the first chief of the Confederate tribes of Slats. My mother was an Indian princess, but they didn't call her that because there wasn't a word in their language for that word princess. But she was that. And uh, he was a nice, he was a nice uh, chief. He went to Washington, D.C. and uh, made decisions. My grandmother said they called him a farseer because those decisions that he made would help our people way down the line, meaning years ahead it would be all right for them. So they called him a farseer. He was a great guy. He was loved by people and he used to walk from Salette's clear over to Grand Round and help that tribe over there to the point where they took a picture of him and put it in St. Mary's Church in a great big window because I got that picture. And I went over there and got that picture from my, that uh, big window and how they did that for him. It was quite a man. And I'm so glad I have my granddaughter made a medallion and some earrings for me and I meant to wear them today and I forgot about it. And, uh, but he was quite a good looking guy too. I have his book, Requiem for People. So you could look it up in the library. Uh, Receive a Dow Beckham. So, and so anyway, I grew up in a little burg called Logson, Oregon, in 1924, September the 11th. And uh, I grew up in, a, in, a, in Lincoln County, Oregon, and at those times there were signs all over the place that Indians and dogs not allowed. 
that's the kind of era I grew up in. So my dad was a musician and told his kids we had to learn music. He said, then if you learn music, you'll always fit in and belong. And he was right, because those kids did grow up and learn. Each one played a different instrument. And I used to play for dances and slats and songs and violins and sing all over Oregon. And uh, he was right. It made us fit in and belong. So we've come a long way since that time, thank God, that I'm still sitting here. And uh, I thank my old people that were all born north of Grants Pass here, and I think it's them that kind of anchored me here, that aura of them. And because I could grow up and live on the res if I want to, but I've been down here all these many years, and I've been glad because it has done a good thing for me too with the stories that I have helped t taught people about my people. They were wonderful people, the Tequilma Indians and all of the Shastas and Shasta Coastas and all of them that lived down here. They'd come together once a year over in a place out of Gold Hill called the Story Chair, a rock hill out in the river with that chair on top. My people would, men, one of the men folk would sit there and there's a big eddy down below and when they'd see a salmon come, that's when they would start the gathering the salmon then and they'd have big salmon ceremonies to greet the salmon and bring all the people together. And they did that, I read my history for 22,000 years. So when I came over here back into Oregon to start the salmon ceremony, it started in 1993. In 1994, the state fish and game came, came, as I said, and wanted to know what I'd done, you know, because there was so much fish in the river. So I think that that story alone could help you to know that when you talk to the water and, and help do something for it, you know, because I want good water and good air for my little ones to grow up so, it, so that they can too grow gray-headed like me. That's my job. This is why I work hard. I think this is why I'm still here above grass to this day, you know, that I, I want to be able to talk to you. Now there's a doctor in Australia who wants to take me to the UN. He said, the people of the UN need to hear my story. And I'm well, if it's meant to be, it'll work. But we, he wants to set a day for a bathing day all over the world. One day for bathing day, to people to acknowledge the water. So it's a crucial thing, I think, that water, <clears throat> of so many places you go to now that they sell bottled water all over. And uh, so you need to think about your, your involvement with water. What can you do as a human being? What can you do to help with, take care of the water? You know, each one of you, if you're older like me, your voice works, teach the little ones. Teach, teach your family. Talk to your water. Teach them to talk to the water. I never even drink water, but what I say, I love you, bless me. You know, it's a habit. I made it uh, to myself. And maybe that's why I'm here for so long. I'll be 94 pretty soon. And I thank God for keeping me above grass. That he has things for me to do and to say. So we all have this job. You know, and I'm glad that I'm here because to me, people that I'm also an ordained minister and people say, well, where's your church? And I say, well, you know, the sky is my roof and the earth is my floor and everything in between is sacred that I'm to pray for. So that means you, all of you, I pray for you and your life and your existence. I pray for you all to have good water, good air, you know, and to be healthy. Watch what goes down your mouth. That's your job. Because I used to be this, oh my gosh, size. I was big, but I took a year for me to get all that weight off and I got rid of my high blood pressure. So it works. So think about your water, you know, that you're using. Stop the soda pop. It'll make you fat, fat, fat. You know, so take care of yourself and, and watch what you're doing. Learn to be healthy is how you run your mind. And what you put down your mouth is your job. Nobody can give you kindness, happiness, you know, or laughter, or all this good stuff. That's your inside job. So if you want kindness, 
You better have it in there so you can give it away and you can get it back. I know that. So you try it. Kindness. Teach your kids kindness. Kindness and love and respect and honor and compassion. That's, I told my kids, I can't give that to them. If they want that, they got to create it themselves. So I, you could teach your children a lot of beautiful things. One of the greatest things that you could teach them is L-O-V-E. Love is all there is. Because if you love yourself, and I'm not talking about ego love, I'm just talking about love yourself, to love your life, that you got life. Be thankful you got life, or you'd be D-E-A-D, -E you know. So enjoy your walk. You got one time to walk this earth. Make it a good one. Make it a good one. The hardest journey that all of you will ever make is from your thinking thing to your heart. That's the longest journey you'll ever know, the hardest. When you get there, I say that's that aha stage. Aha, now I know who I am. Aha, I know where I'm going. Aha, I know what I need to be doing. So work hard at it, you know, and always give thanks to God. If it wasn't for God, I don't think we'd be here. And I'm not talking church or religion either. Because my people said when they left and went to the star nation, they left this one duty. And that duty was prayer. And it works, I'm telling you, it works. I used to call my boys, they're all gone up there now. But I used to call them and do some prayers and send prayers to them to, to call me. And they'd say, they'd call me up and say, what do you want? So I knew God helped me with those prayers. And so prayer does work. For any, any walk of life you're in, you have that, you have that uh, a way to stop and give thanks just for being, just for being, taking up this little spot. You know, be thankful for that. So anyway, growing up here was, was um, being down here, I feel great of being down here close to my old ones. Right where I'm sitting down the river by the bank over here, some of them were found and dug up right here by this restaurant. And I had, it put, had them put back and fixed in such a way, in a beautiful way, they'll never be disturbed again. And there's a little monument down there on their behalf of my people of the river. And so all my people were of the river. They, 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 ate, they ate fish, they ate everything out of the waters. And they didn't pollute it either those times. So I need to have you all to think about what you're doing with your life. Are you helping any, doing anything? How about garbage? Are you taking care of that? Are you teaching kids not to do things with garbage? There's a place for it. There's a lot of things, good things you need to teach your children. You know, one of the greatest gifts that they can laugh is, is laughter. Laughter is one of our cheapest medicines too. You know, and, and we get, we get uh, vitamins from the sun. So enjoy it when you're in the sunshine. There's a lot of things that, that you can learn about what you eat and what's in it. Learn what's in your food. You know, get the right vitamins that you need every day. Don't get too big because that's going to cost you, just going to make you get sick. There's some huge people out there that they're going to have more health problems than, than a slim person would. And so watch what you're doing and putting down your mouth. So I pray that all the people that live here will respect our old ones of this land. I, I'm still trying to get uh, the state of Oregon to have a indigenous day one day uh, in, on our calendar one day a year. You know, if they don't want to move Columbus Day, they could just leave it there, but put Indigenous Day on our map. Help me to do that. I want to talk to our governor already. I want to do maybe a salmon ceremony maybe in July, if I can pull one off, if I get the help of my tribe to get me salmon. Even though my son has gone on, I think we can get people to help me to do this and invite our governor and the rest of the, uh, some people from the other nine tribes to come, to come together to honor this thing of Indigenous Day. Help us to get it on the map. It's long overdue, you know, because when Columbus came to the East Coast, he said he found it was occupied and they didn't speak English. It was a six nation of our people over there. 
So when he left, he sent the word around the world that this land was occupied and they were pagan and heathen. So the next thing we knew, here come the guns. Started the Trail of Tears across the United States, even wiped out some tribes completely that are gone. And so it's, it's, it's a thing that's on my heart to try to get Indigenous Day on our calendar. So help me, it's long overdue. We're entitled to it. I'd like to see it before I go to the Star Nation. Anyway, you know, the people here, it, they struggled and they had a hard time. Life wasn't easy. They didn't have houses like we do. They had these little little hut-like things. And I've had one made now, and if you want to see it, it's over at uh, Kirbyville uh, between Grants Pass and Cave Junction. There's one there, and I think it's the only one in the state and uh, from the replica of what they used to live in. It came about because I got a picture of one of them down on the uh, uh, I-5, uh, I mean on 101 going down to California and I brought it back and I showed my old friend George Fence that used to call me mom and a full blood Cherokee Indian, quite a, quite a guy, really knowledgeable man and uh, he finally wrote a grant and he said we need to build one here mom. I said okay. So then they got the grant and he said, where are we going to put it? And I said, well, I don't want to put it way out because there's some rednecks around here. And I said, and then I don't want to make it into a playhouse. You know, I want it to be a replica for the old ones and have it to where people can look at it and know that this was the true thing that my people lived in. And so then it was built. So if you ever want to come and see it, it's over behind the Kirby Museum in Kirby, uh, Oregon, between just a little a couple of miles from Cave Junction, and about 27 miles, I think, from Grants Pass. But anyway, it's the first and only one that I know of that's here in the state that they call it Little Pit House. And they had it too high when they put it up, and I made them take it all down and uh, lowered the roof kind of squatty like and uh, then put the smoke hole up and it's quite the thing and i said i don't know uh, how i can get in it because way back there i had a bad back and so they made the hole a little bigger and i said i don't want a hobo sleeping in it or kids using it for a playhouse so we better put a door on it which isn't which wasn't traditional but <clears throat> anyway they put the door in there and then they took a limb and cut some steps on it and put it uh, on the side so I could get down inside when I wanted to go in there and do my prayers and use it uh, to be able to teach people about how my people lived in there. So take a look at it. It's really nice. I don't know if there's another one anywhere. So yeah, we had a big, uh, uh, I cooked salmon over there to dedicate that little house too. And it went off really, really nice. So stop by when you're leaving Cave Junction going towards Grants Pass and take a look. It's still there. Been there, I think, I don't know, good 15 years now, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> what else, Mary Jane? <clears throat> Go ahead. So, yeah. Oh, that's me. Bill. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Well, what do you want me to say? Oh my gosh, there's so much. Um, oh, what about being a student at SOU? Well, being a student at Southern Oregon University, I won a scholarship over there and I graduated in 1985 with the uh, honors in psychology and Native American studies. And I was the only one in my family that, uh, of us older ones, uh, graduated in college. And I'm still pretty proud of that to this day. And I'm also, uh, uh, I belong to the Delta Kappa. Epsilon? Epsilon, yeah, I'm a lifetime member of a sorority. And I'm the only any woman that I know of that belongs to a sorority. And uh, so it was really a thing because my oldest brother, 
uh, George and my brother Tiny Lloyd uh, stood beside me when I was in my cap and gown and I, I have that picture and they were pretty proud of me too and uh, talking about it now it seems like a long 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 time ago now but my mother used to always say you go on and get that b piece of paper sissy I said I will and so I did. When I graduated from high school, I stood there and, and uh, gave a talk and uh, told my mom I got that paper. And she says, keep going. So I kept going and so I did. I got my, my uh, degree in, in psychology and, and Native American studies because I could hear my mother's voice all the time prodding me along. I was in Crescent City and I sit there and I went home and I had some water, I just had lunch and I went home out on my deck, I had a little table and my big dog was laying down there and I had some water left there and I sit there thinking about what God wanted me to do, be a voice for the voices. I just told God I don't understand. And so then a big, the tree right next to me, the leaves began to move. And I watched that and I thought, oh, the air, the wind, is that what you mean? Be a voice for the wind and the air? Huh. So then I reached over, got my water, my eyes went right to the water. Oh, you don't have a voice either. Oh God, I'm beginning to understand. And by then I'm just crying. Then my big dog stood up and he was patting his head on my knee and I was patting him and I looked at him and I about choked on my spit. <gasps> you don't have a voice either. The animals don't have a voice. Oh God, and I'm really bawling. Oh yes, I'll be a voice for the voiceless. So there's people, even David West remembers a long time ago, I used to go around all over the country being voice, teaching people to be a voice for the voiceless. But God has told me, done me so many things. Like I could, or didn't hear from one of my kids, I'd said prayers, resumes, I'd hear a call. What do you want? My sons especially, I had to hear from them. <laughs> what do you want? My, my son, he used to tell me, I'm rolling, rustling around in his own bed. My youngest son and his wife was up at Taft, Oregon, what they call Lincoln City now. And he called me, I was down here in Grants Pass. Mom, you gotta get up here. I said, what for? Somebody keeps trying to break into our house, but if you come up here and bless it and everything, that won't happen. Well, I said, I can't come right now, I'm busy. But I'll tell you what, I said, I'll go and and light my smudgy bowl and get out on the deck and I'll, I'll send you some prayers your way. I could do that and later on I'll come up. So I did. I went out and I on my deck and I did some prayer and blew the smoke up that way and told God you could take care of that. I can't go right now. And so I did all that. About an hour goes by and here's the phone ringing again. It was him. Mom, what did you do? I said, what do you mean what did I do? What did you do? We got to the house and there was all this sage and stuff all over the house and the inside was just full. What did you do? I said, don't thank me, thank God. Wow. You know, and so I said, that's some of the stories of long distance prayer, how God can answer, you know. And it took care of those kids though, it took care of their home, you know. And a lot of people that have called for prayers, you know, like a doctor's wife who wanted a baby so bad years ago. She was back in Chicago. And I said, if you will, got a few moments, I'll pray with you. And I said, when I pray, you use your right hand to hang on the phone, put your left hand on your tummy, okay? So I told her that. The next time I said, you have relations with your, your husband, I said, think about it. Your, God's going to help you to conceive. You get your child. Do you believe in what God can do? She said, yes. 
you believe this prayer? And so she said, yes, I believe this prayer. And I said, well, I'm going to leave that in God's hands with you. And you thank God whenever it runs through your head that this will work and you will have your child. Because they tried everything, I guess. And so several months go by when she calls me again, crying, and said it worked. So that's just some of the stories how God has done. My son was dying in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And uh, he was one of the top welders at Knott's Berry Farm, and he fell and literally broke his back. So he was in pain, and he had to live on heavy pain pills, which finally was affecting his liver. And so they was in Jackson Hole when his wife, Sharon, called up, Mom, Bob's dying. And I said, do me a favor. I said, will you go get his prayer feathers? I had the white feathers from the eagle's tail that steers the eagle. And I had made him a bunch of those. And I said, will you go get his prayer feathers and put them in his hand? She said, he can't talk to you. He just whispers, you won't hear him. I said, that don't matter. He could still whisper his prayer. And you put that phone up to his ear, put the feathers in his hand, and I'll pray with him. So she did. And I prayed and told him, I said, my son, you're not going to die yet. It's going to be a while yet. So you believe and talk to God that he could keep you here for a while, okay? So he did. So three days later, I'm home, and over in Crescent City, I heard this big old deep voice hollering up at me, Mother, how are you? And I said, Keith, where are you? I thought you were supposed to be up to Smith River helping those guys at the church. Mother, who do you think this is? I said, Keith, mother, this is Robert, a big old voice. He's, and, he, he, and I was crying when he said that was him. And how that quick, three days, you know, he had that big strong voice and he was up. He didn't die just several years after that. So he called you? Yeah. Wow. Three days after. Wow. He was. Well, yeah. Yeah. Days. Wow. Yeah. A lot of stories of people like that. Like a little guy from Africa called one year. Grandma, I hate to bother you, but he said, there's just a few pygmy elephants down here and I would like to bring them back. Will you pray with me? I said, right now on the phone, you got time? He said, oh, yes. So I prayed with him, forgot what his name was, Canoe, Canoe, something like that, K something, and uh, it was several years ago. And uh, I said, I pray, I think that you have a good heart, and I think God's already heard you, and he will help you because you, your heart is leading out to these little animals. That he put, he's put the, the, the heavy stuff on you to do this. And so I already feel like it's in the works or you wouldn't be feeling like this. And so I talked to him and we prayed. So then now several, what, three or four years go by, he calls up, I'm this man that called you about the pygmy elephants. He said, I want to tell you I have a hundred of them. So see how God has helped people that I have don't even know who they are. You know, there's so many stories of people that have wanted something. You know, like people, pregnant women. I got to tell you this story about this cane. I'm down in Lucas Valley. You know George Lucas? The Star Wars? Yes. All right. Well, anyway, I'm down there in his house. And one of his workers, uh, uh, Jade, she said, we got something for you. So she brought this out, oh. this cane, and gave it to me a long time ago. And I'm down there staying in his house. Nady was with me. Yeah. And how that they, how that they uh, like me to have one of their canes. So that's from George Lucas. George Lucas, yeah, and Jane Bay. Wow. Jane Bay, she worked with him and stayed down there in Lucas Valley. I stayed in his house. 
You know, I've done a lot of things. I've cooked at Washington, D.C. by the monument, and salmon on sticks. I've cooked in New York. I've cooked in Hollywood, you know, to raise scholarships for Native people. I cooked out of Florence, Oregon, where there was nothing for the uh, uh, Calvinistic Confederation of Canada and the United States, nine busloads. How I pulled that off with my husband and some of the year old cooks and had people come to cut the grass way out on the beach and I had my water come from Corvallis, Oregon, all my wood from Toledo, Oregon. It was a huge thing. And we got all our salmon and I had the guy that brought the water truck from Corvallis and he'd stand at the end of all these tables and as they threw a fish up, he'd have the water ready. Somebody had cut off the fins and go up to another one, cut off the tail of the head, go up and somebody would fillet it out. Go on down, somebody cut them up into pieces, go on down in another pan and they'd have the pieces and put them on the sticks. Go on down with the sticks and somebody down there to season them all. Go on down and there were some young people in my tribe to take them over to the cooks or on the pit. Went off like... Remember uh, Nadine cooked for World Peace and Prayer Day? Uh, huh? Remember when Arvel yeah, came and they Yeah, cooked cook for, yeah. That yeah, was, she's good too. Yeah. And so they're, now they're wanting me to pull off another salmon ceremony for it and try to get in Ditch's Day on the, on the calendar. And I said, well, I got, I'm going to call maybe tomorrow if I get time to, uh, to up to my tribe and see if they'll help me with about 350 pounds of salmon. And if they will, we'll try to get enough money together to pull the other stuff off. Yeah, and I hope so. Anyway, I've got the sticks, I got the knives, and I got the tables. And you know how to do it. You have the prayer. Oh yeah, oh yeah. If it's meant to be, it'll work. Yeah, I'll talk to God. These are nice fifty. You could, kids can do better than that. Do it now. You know. So I said it's it's beneficial to to nobody but yourself. You know. So I said, it's beneficial to nobody but yourself to what you put in here. The only thing is, it has to come back out. I told them when grandmother's in, and they said, what can we do? It was over in Australia. What can we do? We're all getting old and gray-headed. I said, your voice still works. Teach in the schools. You could teach the kids. You know, you could, you could, there's a lot you could do. You know, your, your head works, your mouth works, you can teach. And there's always something you could do. If you love, you could do it. Yeah. Yeah, I used to work with all of them over there, in different parts of the, uh, Australia, everywhere. And how proud I was of all of those people over there. Yeah. I said, everybody's got talent of some kind. I said, God gifted us some talent. So you could do a lot of different things that you never thought you could do. A lot of people say, well, we're not good enough. I said, if it pleases you, it's good enough. You know, if it's comforting to you, it's good enough. Yeah. I always tell people, quit putting yourself down. You know, everybody's got a gift. If they What's just... the first thing that you did that sort of pushed you up, gave you courage? Well, I'm going to tell you, a long time ago, <clears throat> as girls, you know, my mom was very sick when I was young. And uh, so my dad and them, they worked out. My brothers worked out in logging camps. And my younger brother said, you're going to have, you girls are going to teach you to box. We can't be real and take care of you all the time. You got to learn. So they did. They taught us how to box. And so when I was in a freshman in high school, when they started goofy up around me, I duped it out of them. They finally left me alone. And so my brother said, we can't be around protect you girls. You've got to learn to do it yourself. So nobody messed with our, or my, my sisters either. They were tough. And we all were. We didn't go around bullying anybody, but if anybody tried to, to push around on us, we'd just duke it out with them. And then I was a log truck driver. I had my own log truck when I was young. 
an old L-190, and I had to get out and run up on the cold deck, set my chokers, run down, set the buckers on the truck, swing the logs over. And the only thing I couldn't do, I couldn't throw the chain over. I had to crawl up and drop it down and then hook it up. But the Indians used to laugh to see me driving a lug truck. Yeah, and then I was a race driver. They, my pit men taught me everything, and to this day, I still drive with all of those good things they taught me. And I used to win all my races, too. They used to gang up on me. Won it with the wooden tire going off of my wheel. It came off before I got to the checkered flag. But uh, I did those kind of things and used to peel children to make money. Cascara bark, yeah, with an LMM Luger on my hip way out in the woods. And, yeah, carried my Chit them back to some of my relatives, couldn't even pick it up. They'd put it over, we had a big D8 cat, and they'd take that sack and drag it over and set it up on the track to put it on. And uh, I used to do that too. I was, I was pretty husky. I wasn't a bully, I always took care of the underdog. I didn't like nobody picking on nobody. There were some girls from Switzerland, and they'd get on the bus, and some of those kids would pick on them. I said, you better watch out. I'll duke you up, duke it out with you, you know. So they pretty much got to leave them alone, because they didn't, they'd know I would really tie into them. But I wanted that fairness. I didn't like nobody ganging up on nobody. I come around the corner in Portland one time off of the Broadway Bridge, my husband and I, and there was a, any woman there and two white gals beating her up. I said, park the car. And I jumped out and ran over to threw those two girls out in the street. And they jumped up, was coming at me, and I, boy, I just let them have it. And to, to leave her alone. I don't know who the woman was they'd beaten on. I didn't need to know, but that's not fair. Two on one. And they were big girls beating on her. So anyway, things like that, you know. Uh, How did you leave home? Huh? How did you leave home? What happened? How did I leave home? My mother passed away when I was about 12 years old. And I went to live with one of my brothers and his wife. And then I went to went down in Grand Eden Beach, Oregon, uh, and out close to Deepa Bay and stayed with my other brother and his wife and catch the bus to go to school. And so then my other brother moved down there, my oldest brother and his wife, so I moved with them and went to school, graduated in Taft, Oregon. After I got out of school there, then I uh, went and got a job in a nursing home in Portland and worked for a doctor, Dr. Dr. Reuben Green. And, uh, stayed in their home way up on the hill out of Portland. And uh, I should take care of that little, their little baby. And now today I think he is uh, uh, obstetrician in Salem. Yeah, never did get over there to see him. But I used to take care of him when he's a baby. And uh, so I did a lot of different things. I would run the archive in uh, Vancouver, BC, at the Veterans Hospital. Yeah, I did that, and then I worked in Tillamook Hospital, run the uh, autoclave up there, and did run the sterilizer and worked in the hospital. And uh, I did a lot of things like that. I was on the radio off and on. I played the music everywhere, too, in the meantime. Uh, I was pretty busy doing a lot of stuff. How old were you when the, in 93? When the water re revelation kind of hit you. When the what? The water. When the when you were told to take care of the water. How old was I? Hmm. Yeah, oh, forty-five maybe. Pretty young. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, I fought that too. When he wanted me to come do the Sabbath here, but wouldn't stop. I had to go do it. I took absence, a leave of absence from my job to go do that. But it went well. Mm -hmm. People were just astounded how good that fish tasted like that. Yeah. Can you tell us your, your, fam your family names? Who, your mom, your dad, your grandparents? 
your brothers and sisters? What did she say? Family names, like your parents' names. Oh, my mother's name was Evelyn Lydia Harney Baker. And my dad was George Wentworth Baker. He was Kusini. My mother was Takilma. My oldest, my oldest brother, his name was Stoney. He was um, uh, stillborn. And then my sister Marion was next, and then my brother George, they called him Budgie. Then after him was my brother Lloyd, we called him Tiny. And then was my sister Evelyn, and then was my brother Theral, they called him Terry. And then there was me, and then after me was Gloria, no, after me was my brother Gilbert, they called him Gib, and after Gib was Gloria. And I'm the only one living of all of them. And I'm older now than my grandmothers and mothers and dads when they left. And I just think God had his hand on me all this time to be able to say that. To That's do a lot of children in your family. Oh yeah. Children. Yeah. yeah. So now I gotta go up. I already ordered uh, them to cut the grass going to our cemetery up to Logson, Oregon. And because I want to take Nadine up with the camera so that w she could see where all my mom and my grandfather and all of them were, were they were there lay. And so they could get flowers into them. I didn't get there last year. I was gone. And so this year I want to make it up there. And I already ordered them, the guys at my tribe to go up there with the lawnmowers and mow it all flat. Yeah. And you work, your family worked with um, Harrington? Yeah. The anthropologist? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, my, it was a really a bunch of wonderful people as I look back. They, they really lived that long in Southern Oregon down here until they thought that that land all belonged to them. You know, and it was a sad thing in 1856 for them to leave. And uh, Grandma said how it hurt them. And uh, but anyway, he died. My great grandfather, Chief George Hardy, on a runaway horses in 1912. Yeah, and they used to. Long time ago, people my tribe said my dad was a white man. Till I got, till I got into school, and then I looked it up and traced it out that he went to school in Chamawa, and I said no way could he go out there to school if he was a white man. It was harder then than it is today. And so I finally got it straightened out and got the blood quantum raised of everybody, a lot of them that didn't get on or on. And so that was a good thing, yeah. And I've helped my people so many times in so many ways, you know, in trying to stop the meanness. You know, trying to stop the meanness. You know, when you get older and you said you got one foot in a banana peel and the one up there, you better watch what you're doing. You know, yeah. Because, you know, you know, death to us a long time ago, even when I was a little kid, that they would lift us up if there was a death and somebody was there. And they'd make open that casket and we had to look. We had to understand about dying and what it meant. And it was something you know, and uh, how our people taught us, you know, about death and dying, how it was our job to watch what went down here when we were little, even, you know, and how we got along outside and try to tell my brothers, don't be hitting us girls, you know, you know, I supposed to be hitting women, and all kinds of stuff they taught us a long time ago, and one of the biggest things is how you walk, you don't walk in front of your elders. You know, you, you always say, excuse me, if you have to, or pardon me. We had to learn all the magic words, even at the table. My dad said, when you guys get to the table, that's not the war zone. You know, no arguing and fussing at the table. That was a sacred place. A lot of good things my people had for us as we grew up, you know, With how to get kids, What did you eat? Huh? All those kids, what did you eat? We have always had our, we had our boats, we had our net, my dad made nets, and we caught fish, we had our eels, we had gardens, all of us had a row. I started out with four little plants. They showed me the difference between a plant and a weed. 
pretty soon I got big long lines before I went to school. Four of them. I'd had to water and weed before I went to school. And so we had to learn all these things. We had to learn, I remember standing on top of an apple box learning to cook mm -hmm. when I was eight years old. What did you remember cooking? I made pancakes, fried eggs, made oatmeal, you know. I could just see me right now standing up there making that stuff, cooking for my mom. And then I had a bed put next to her because at night, she had a big long stick she'd have to poke me to wake me up to get her water and give her her medicines at night. Yeah, so I had to take it. Then I got to go into sleep in school and they found out I was taking care of my mom. So the superintendent had moved all my classes in the morning. The teachers let me have lunch in the teacher's room and then I could go in the teacher's room and sleep. And then they'd wake me up at four o'clock to catch the bus. Wow. And then the principal found out about it, and so he upped me from sixth grade into the eighth and bumped me into my brother's class, and my brother was just mad. Yeah, but anyway, they helped me a lot, long, you know. Did you have horses? Oh yeah, we had our own. When we were little, my mom could break horses where men were mean to them, you know. Wow. She would whistle and pet them, walk around, whisper to them, and all this stuff. And she had them in the horse. She could just whistle, and way out in the orchard, they'd hear her, and hear her. They'd come, their tails are flying, their mane are flying, coming to the house. And then she taught one of them to put his head way down. When the kids were little, we'd just like get up on his neck, and then he'd raise his head up, and we'd slide down on his back. And the four of us would get on there like that. And we'd ride around, walk around all over the house, around the house, every place with that, that horse with us on the back. Old Jip, we sure cried when he died. A log truck hit him. No gravel truck hit him, he broke his leg. Yeah, and they had to shoot him. And, and, uh, but anyway, mom taught that horse to do that. So we all grew up with horses, huh? Oh yeah, we each had our, we had to feed the chickens and we boys had to, my brothers had to milk the cows and, and my brothers, their job, the younger ones, were to go get the cows in. One time they, dad come home, you get, you get the cows milk, we couldn't find them. You couldn't find them. Why? We looked. Well, we had better go look again because you got to go find them. Dad went out there and there they had stuffed, those kids had stuffed moss up into their bells so they wouldn't ring. Dad swatted them on the butt and said, you get those cows to the barn and you milk those cows. Yeah, <laughs> crazy kids. Taught us how to fish, to row a boat, set a net, all those things. And then they had trap lines in those days. I said, wonder I didn't smell like some of those things drying on those boards, those pelts. But they never did say anything like that. But yeah, they'd catch those things and mink and stuff and sell them. Yeah. And so we were taught how to swim and they to learn to swim. They, my one brother make me hold my hands like this and one under this arm, one, two, three, two, out you go. Third time they said we'll we'll pull you in, but then you start learning to dog paddle, you know, to learn to swim. That's how I learned to swim. Yeah, but we all had to learn because we're close to water. Dad said it may save your life or you might save somebody's. So I saved my cousin's life one time, and uh, anyway saved her from drowning. But anyway, they taught us a lot of things like that. Us girls had to cook, and my sisters were sure good cooks, too. You were pretty young in the family, though. Yeah, but you still had to learn. Yeah, if you had to stand on an apple box. Yeah. But we all, we all were good cooks, you know. Mom said, if you're going to cook, you make sure your food tastes right and it's cooked right. And don't be mean, don't be mad, because if you're mad when you learn to cook, it never turns out right. How about quilting or sewing? Huh? Quilting. Quilting, they had quilting bees too. Yeah. Way up on the hill, and then they had big canneries. Cost us a penny a can from the government to can our salmon and meat and stuff. Great big fat tubs, you know, to put them in to can them. They had a big cannery. 
and we all had to do that. Dad made nets and the boys run the nets and the trap lines, you know. So I can't ever, ever remember. We had big gardens, all, everything, all kinds of vegetables that we grew. Tell me what, what you grew. What did you grow? Oh, we had potatoes, we had carrots, onions, celery, oh God, what else? Peas, I remember the big peas, we had to string the strings up so the peas could go up. And I used to go out to eat off of the, off of the vine. And we had apple, all kinds of apples in a big orchard. And we had what hook and eels, and we had chickens, we had eggs, we had cows, we had calves, we had horses, we had wagons, and everything. Yeah, an old king car. What did you trade for? Huh? What did you trade for or buy? Buy? Or we can, I could go down to the store. I worked for some people about a mile from our house, way up on what we call Red Hat Hill. I worked for them all day for a dollar. And then I'd go down to the store and buy my mom some oranges and whorehound candy that she liked to suck on. And I'd get those things and I'd still have money left. And, uh, but anyway, we had, we, I don't ever remember being hungry for anything. We had all kinds of garden stuff. And we had rhubarb and we had Logan berries, all kinds of berries. We had blackberries, evergreens that we'd go pick and, and make jelly and, and uh, have jam. You know, we never bought any of that stuff. We made all of it. Did you dry any food? Oh yeah, we had we had a smokehouse all the many years. Even after my my husband died, uh, I still kept a smokehouse. You know, because my kids sure like smoked fish and stuff. I even used to put chickens up in the smokehouse until a guy came from. He was from um, um, an Indian from uh, South Dakota, and. Uh, he said, what kind of meat is in these beans? I said, chicken. Chicken? Never heard of chicken. And I said, well, yeah, we, we took it and hung it in a smokehouse and saw it smoke. He said, I taste the smoke. I never heard of him using chicken. And he was just dumbfounded. So we hung chicken up in the smokehouse so that it would get put it in our beans. And so anyway, we had a lot of stuff. Mom canned all kinds of used those apples and even the peelings and made jellies, all kinds of different kind of berry jellies and jams and stuff. And she would uh, pickle stuff and I never had those things anymore. But uh, I used to can everything too when I got my hands on. And uh, growing up when my kids were little. Did your sisters cook? Were your sisters good cooks? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. What's your strongest food memory? What do you remember eating then? Oh, my sister Evelyn was uh, Chinese food. Man, she could make good Chinese food. Ooh -wee. Yeah, and, very native. and even my son, he, you know, he was the best sticky rice cook I ever met. Where he could just wad it and stick to the wall. You know, he was sticky rice. And my oldest boy could cook anything. We made cakes, frosted cakes, all these. I told my boys, you're gonna do everything. You're, someday you're gonna get married and your wife's gonna get sick or something and you have to do her work. So you're gonna to learn to run the laundry, do the laundry, you're gonna to learn to cook. All my boys cooked. The, the last one, Keith, he was a good cook. He could cook any old thing. Yeah, and I could someday you're going to get married, your wife's going to get sick, and you're going to have to do her work. And that means your laundry. So I made those boys. I said, after you're nine, after you're nine years old, I'm not your maid anymore. You know, <laughs> you got to do your own picking up of all your stuff. You're going to learn to make your bed. You know, you're going to learn to wash dishes. Even my boys had to take turns wash dishes. How many children did you have? I had six, three boys and three girls. All in that little house that you live in? Yeah. No, not there. It was up to, way up to Logston. Was a, yeah. And, uh, but anyway, up to Slats, who started. And I lived in Tillamook for a long time, too. I worked in the hospital for a long time up there. Uh, but anyway, uh, 
I can't ever remember any hardship when I was a kid. We always dressed good. You know, we would work and go out into the Independence, Oregon, to the hop fields in the summer and pick hops and make our school clothes. We didn't have to buy our food, our lunches at school. The government furnished that for us. And uh, my mother had a Maytag, putt, putt, Maytag washing machine. And I didn't have to scrub on the washboard anymore. And uh, side iron, we had electric iron. And we had these sad irons. Uh, but anyway, we, we learned to sew when we were young. Anything got ripped, we had to sit down and sew it. No pins. If we pinned, mother would get on us. We had to fix it. And uh, so there's a lot of stuff, you know, that uh, even prayer it taught us how, to, that we're, how we're supposed to pray and give thanks. And those things, how us kids work to walk in front of an elder without saying, pardon me, excuse me, Let, learn all the magic words. You know, someday you're going to give these magic words to your own kids, and I did. You know, just like what God called me when I was about 40-something years old to do this spiritual path. I can't do that. I'm not worthy. You give it to somebody else. Well, that didn't work. It kept coming, it kept coming. So finally I said, I'll do it. So the next thing I did is I went to my kids. They weren't married, they're all, all, all adults now. And I went to my kids and I told them how God has called me to do this spiritual path. And I said, I, I made mistakes with you kids. I've hurt you in some way, but I want your forgiveness before I do this. So I did that. Went to all of them. He went way down Southern California. My son Keith was way down there, so I went down there and told him that too, to ask for forgiveness. I said, someday you kids will get married, and, and there's no such a thing as parent school, so you'll probably make mistakes and hurt your kids too, but teach them forgiveness so that they can forgive you someday. And uh, so I thank my kids for forgiving me, and so then I began to. <clears throat> listen to God then and there's, there's things that he wanted me to do. And so it's been that way all these many years now. And I thank God because through all of the, the things that I have completed that he gives me, that's why I'm here. Because I'm minded and I love my God. I gotta call my mom. <laughs> huh? my mom. You got her thinking about her mother. Oh, yeah. Love is all there is, whether she deserves it or not. You know, I was called to, there was 20, several years ago to Sandy, Oregon, to come and pray for these grandfathers. There's 27,000 of them at that time, circling the globe, mentoring young men and speaking to audiences. So they called me up to Sandy, Oregon, and Peter Cotton, do you know Peter Cotton from Ashland? I don't. You could talk to him. He went with me when they, we went up. He was one of them, these grandfathers. And so I went up to Sandy, Oregon, and I'm talking to God up there, and I said, God, well, what do you say to grandfathers? You gotta help me, I don't know. I'm at, I'm at a loss for words. So I'm getting up on the stage and I looked at all these gray-headed guys and I thought, God, you give me the words now. So I'm standing there and took a deep breath and looked out. I thank you for calling me to come. I thank you so much. And uh, I thank you for what you're doing as you journey around the world. To do that, you're, you're mentoring young men and to be mentoring young men, you had to say thanks to your mother because it took a woman's body to bring you all into this world. So give thanks to your mother right now, whether you love her or not. Through her, you got your first breath. So afterwards, some of them said they never thought of that. And, uh, but anyway, that's what God gave me right off the bat. Never thought of it until I stood up there, and I was sweating. But anyway, and then I went back to uh, Deer Park, Pennsylvania. They called me back, the men back there, the grandfathers. And I told them the same thing. 
And they were astounded. Some of those guys said they never thought to ever thank their mom for their first breath. I said, it's never too late. If she's still above grass, you better tell her, thank you for your life. And so then I met with the bear dancers and they didn't want the women to do bear dancing. I said, why not? You bear, the bears wouldn't have got into this world if it wasn't for a female bear either. So they served their purpose. And so now they're letting the women to bring their medicine forward to the bears. You mean the Archie? Those guys that come up to my, you know, yeah. Kitty and uh, Chatui and them. From well, now they're, they're, the women can form theirs. The from Reading. Yeah. 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 So they could form it because I said, in order for the bears to come into this world, took a female bear too, didn't it? I told them. So they, got, they serve a great purpose. If it wasn't for the female bear, you guys wouldn't have been here. You wouldn't have bear, bear men, male bears, you know. So now they, they're coming forward. We got to get going. They're going to oh, start yeah. using the room. Oh, that's right. They need the room. Oh, God. We got time. So it's 10 after 4. Yeah, we got time. 5 o'clock. Well, I hope you're satisfied with it. Oh, if not, I'm not, not too far away. There's so much to say, so much. Yeah, it's always good to hear. Yeah. And they wanted a, a picture of me uh, to go uh, to make the statue. And they, this guy said, I don't want a picture, I want her. And so I, I went over and they made, carved me, Russell Beebe, uh, he lives over there out of um, Pallant, and um, I think he's Ojibwe, mm -hmm. yeah. And he's quite a carver, and so he carved me on this alder tree, and uh, with my arms up and had all, I took a, a, a suitcase of my uh, different necklaces and stuff that he, my caps and things that he could pick out which ones would be okay that he could carve. And we did that, and he had me to raise my arms up as I would be standing there praying. So I did. So they carved me in full regalia and had me on this tree. And then down below me was a baby in a papoose basket, and then there was a snake on that tree, I think a deer, a salmon, and there was a lot of animals on this pole with me. And then, over the years, it began to crack. And when it did, in the winter, it cracked and water get in there and it had freeze and it cracked some more. And then it got moldy and then the top of my head got moldy where Russell Beebe had to go up there in the ladder to clean it all up. And then finally they said it had to be taken put some more. So, uh, Matthew Haynes, a lawyer, that he's the one produced the tree and helped to pay to get it done, lives over there. And so him and Russell and I went around into SOU campus looking for a place to put this tree out of the weather. And so we finally found a place there in the library, up close to the window. <clears throat> they wanted to put it in the foyer. And I said, oh no, people will be barking on it out there, <clears throat> putting things on it. So anyway, they let us put it by the window in the foyer, out of the way, and then Russell carved some beautiful benches for people to come and sit to use it for an interpretive center or to sit and pray, whatever. It is still there. If you want to go look at it, it's still sitting there. And from that tree, they got a man that did it in bronze. His name was Jack. And so he did it in bronze, and I even went over and had they call me, and I went over and I was chipping all that stuff off of my head. <laughs> it was funny. And so anyway, they've got it, I think it's about 17 feet high over there that's done in bronze. And then they got some cement benches there that you could sit and meditate or sit, just sit and rest, whatever. But it's, it still stands there. And uh, they named a mountain after me. I, I don't know whether they ever got it on the map, but it was Tawaiwi Peak. My, my name, name is Tawaiwi, which means morning star. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, go have a look at uh, 
the statue over there as you're going in on uh, Main Street, going into Ashland, on just right into town. It's right on your left, you're going down a little hill. Take a look at it. So, a lot of people go over there and say they're glad it's there. I'm proud, too, that it'll be there in perpetuity, as far as I know. Do you want to explain? Yeah, they got the three uh, tattoo marks on my chin on it, too, on both of them. And uh, it came to me a long time ago, the vision from the, the creator, what, how this was supposed to look. And uh, I kept putting it off and putting it off until some years went by and my tribe called and said there were 17 Maoris coming to our tribe, that they wanted me to come up and bless them. I said, all right. So I went up. And in that 17, there was uh, a master tattooist and a one man that he had trained was there with him. So when they called me to come up, I asked Mark, from over there in New Zealand, if he brought his uh, tools, he said, oh, yes, ma'am. Can you do my markings? He said, yes. So when we were up to my tribe, the Confederate tribes, so that's in tribal hall, and they brought me in a chair that leaned way back. And I was just getting in there, lay down, and then I started to get up. He said, where are you going, Grandma? I said, I'm going to get paper and pencil, draw it, what my vision is supposed to look like. Ah, oh, sit down. The other tattooist had already told him. So we were all crying. What a validation. We were all crying uh, to know that, that uh, the other tattooist had already told him what it was supposed to look like. So there was a lot of people lined up over there <clears throat> that wanted something for him to do something on them. And so I said, Mark, just make three lines. And I was going to New Zealand, so I said, we can finish it over in Wellington. So that's where we finished it. But when we were at the tribe, and the other tattooists had told him what this is supposed to look like, everybody was crying, my tribal people, and the Maoris were all crying. I was crying. And um, so they sang, the Maoris were singing it. Oh God, they could sing, it's so beautiful to hear them sing. And then that my tribal people were there, they would sing back and forth, they'd sing. And I was crying most of the time that he was working on me. But anyway, he put just those three lines and when I went to do, over to, to Wellington in New Zealand, and he finished it up, hundreds of Maoris were there singing. I swear to God, that huge building, the walls were weaving in and out when they were singing. It was so beautiful. And so I feel like that I got done what God wanted me to have done. So my daughter has this on her chin, my daughter Nadine, that takes care of me. And I, I just, she can do what she wants too with hers, whatever she wants to have, however she wants it. But anyway, I'm, she she said that Spirit told her to get something on too for it. He did that for her. And so I'm pretty proud that she has that done too. But anyway, I, that it was a great, great connection with those people over there. I've been over there with them several times. And uh, they're such a nice bunch of people. And I got to speak in their government, and it was nice. And so we still have connections over there with them. And it's been such a great thing. And I did this in 2004, uh, right after us grandmas came together in uh, Phoenicia, New York. And it was after that, but the same year. But I'm pretty proud that it's on. I get asked this even by pilots from planes that ask me what it means. But I tell, I told my tribal people when I had this done in 2004, it had disappeared for over 250 years prior to that. So I got, when I did it, and then they did, there was about a six or seven after us that day, but now there's a bunch of them. Even eight up all. Yeah. There's a lot of them up there that has uh, tattoos uh, on them now. So anyway, it was a nice thing. I, I feel good about it now even. But uh, you have to really walk your talk. 
You know, that's being honest. Honesty is one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself. You know, I'm honest to myself, so I'm honest to everybody. You know, I don't fib about anything either. Little white lies, I don't do that either. Because God knows when you tell a story. He knows when you lie or don't tell the truth. He knows. So it's better to be honest from the get-go. So I, I am that. If you're not too tired, do you want to talk about the 13 grandmothers? Oh, you know, when, when we came together, when they called me, I thought, wondered how they heard of me. Because they were way down in Gurneyville, California when the call came. And uh, I said, all right, I'll think about that and pray about it. It took a couple of months of me praying whether to accept it or not. Found out that one of the women that belonged to down there in Gurneyville, Ann, had been up here with Windsong, another friend of mine over there in Williams. They said they watched my walk for four and a half years here. So they knew that they wanted me on this committee. So I finally, finally went. And we were gathered in, out of Phoenicia, New York, back inland to a place called Menla Park where His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the monks all come for their retreat. A beautiful campground of buildings and really nice. And Robert uh, Thurman, his uh, wife, Nina, was taking care of it. I suppose she's still there. And Uma Thurman, their daughter, is a, is a movie actress. And she's really a nice gal. I got to meet her, too. And, uh, but anyway, we came together there. And there was uh, grandmas from all over the world. And when we came together at this huge table, and uh, we were sitting there, my grandma from uh, Alaska, uh, I'm trying to even think of her name right now. Uh, Rita Blumenstein. She's from up there, and when she came with us, uh, she brought a package, and she put it on the table, and she opened it and dumped out thirteen stones that her grandmother gave to her when she was nine years old, said someday to hang on to them, and someday she would sit with other grandmothers. We were all crying. Man, I'm telling you, I, even to mention it now, I was just so shook up and crying, and I thought, what a validation, you know, from that years ago for them to prophesy us coming together. And many people all over the world said how we encouraged them. Elders came up and said they could, wanted to do this. They wanted to do things. It just seemed like they just blossomed like a flower. A lot of places we went to. And how they, uh, so then I was called a couple of years ago to come over there to Italy to meet with uh, the European grandmothers, 26 of them coming out of that, they were supposed to get 13. And uh, they had me to come because they wanted to ask me questions about uh, what us grandmas are doing. And so I pray, even as I speak right now, that they're going strong, that they're doing all right. And I was so proud that I really cried because I thought how that country needed them. You know, needed them to be a guide for peace, for love, to care about each other, to care about their countries, to get along. And I thought how that Europe needed those grandmas. I felt that so strongly when I was over there. So then they had me to come over and I helped them to get started. And I pray as I speak that they're doing great and that they're forging ahead in helping their land because that country sure couldn't use the grandmas. You know, I said, God, God couldn't be everywhere. That's why he created his grandmas. So I have that, that little message on my refrigerator uh, that God couldn't be everywhere, so he created grandmas. So if you're a grandma, think about it. You know, it's a nice, it's a nice place to be in your life, to be a grandmother, to encourage and uphold your children with love. And uh, love to me is all there is. Because I love my life. I love to getting up in the morning. I love what things I can do. I love that I can still get around. I might be crippled, but I'm sure not handicapped. 
And so I, people ask me, how you do it? I said, easy, one foot in front of the other. You got to keep it moving. So use your head, you know, in a good way, not just to help yourself, but to help anybody else. You know, to be, be kind. You want kindness and you better have it in there so you can give it away. You know, so you can take a glass of water and talk to it with kindness, freeze it, and you can prove to yourself how good, pretty it'll look. So you can do that. And uh, you could use music even, different kinds of music, loud, too loud music would make it look cloudy. And you can do your own testing, you know, about your water. So, but I pray that I've said something to keep you encouraged, to keep you looking up, to, to have you to care about your surroundings, about yourself, your insides as well as your outside. Care about your neighbors, how to get along. Stop the biases. God, people are getting killed because we don't like color. But you know, when the white man's Bible came across the great waters, in it, it says, you can look this up. It says, go cleave unto another and make me a new flower garden. Now, haven't we done that? All colors are acceptable. I don't have any, uh, any, any f bad feelings about color. I never did. I always stood up for black people, Mexican people, kids when they were little, I stuck up for them. You know, white kids, I don't, I don't like to see anybody picked on. They, they got a right to stand beside me anytime. I, I was called over to Medford a few years ago that they had a peace pole, a big one over there. They wanted me to come over and to bless that. And I did. When I was there, there was a lot of Japanese people that were there. And when I, everybody got through speaking, I went out and you know what I said? All of this big audience out there and all the different colors of people I said, you know, if I had a sharp knife and I went out amongst all of you and cut your skin off, you'd all look alike. Think about it, I told them. Stop this biases about color. God says, make a new flower garden and that's your job. And that's what we have done. So everybody has a right to stand by me of any color. You got a right to live just as well as I do. And I pray that you hear me, that you will stand tall. No matter what your color is, you have a right to, to being. B-E-I-N-G, right to being as anybody else. You are part of God's flower garden. Don't forget it. Don't let nobody put you down. You know, you got a right to be here. And black is beautiful, white is beautiful, brown, red, all of these colors are beautiful. You know, I thank God that I'm not colorblind, that I could see them all, you know. And I don't have any problem with any of those colors. And this is the way our world should be, right here in America, especially, you know, to accept each other. We're all from God in the first place, you know. And we all walk on the same path. You got one time to walk it, so stop the bias and make it good. You'll be healthier mentally and physically because love is all there is. And again, I'm not talking about ego love. I'm talking about the love of life. L-I-F-E, four little word. You know, I think that that's why God keeps me going because I keep a hooping about this journey from my thinking thing to to my heart. I think God gave us this body and then he gave us this thinking thing and put it above our, our bodies to rule the rest of it. And is it ruling you right? Are you doing right? Because how you, wherever your feet take you, your brain's letting you do, do, telling it to do that. So watch what you're doing with that thinking thing. You know, make it good. Make it the end of your day that you could feel comfortable that you felt good throughout the day. And don't forget to laugh. Laughter is the cheapest medicine you got. Ha, ha, ha. You know, so get out when you can in the sun. That's another thing that's good for us. A little bit of sun, okay? And I hope 
to God that I have said something to any of you that would help you make you feel good about who you are. You got a right to stand beside me. You got a right to speak the same as I do. That's the beauty about being in America, the freedom we have. So shake hands to every veteran you meet. It's through them that we have this freedom. And those that have gone on that gave their all. You know, I always remember them too, the freedom that we have in this world. And so I pray that you could talk to God wherever you are, day or night. And I'm not talking church, I said. I'm not talking religion. I've got a right, you got a right to do that to sit quietly and thank God for your life or whatever, you know, to help you, whatever. And I pray that you could do that. That freedom we have here allows you to do that. And I hope that I have said something that will keep you forging ahead, learning, learning, learning. It's your job too. Old as I am, I read everything I get my hands on. I'm listening to the news. I do my prayers when I hear things about like those 13 kids down in California that their parents had them tied up and chained up and wouldn't feed them. And oh God, I don't know how parents could do such a God awful thing. And, uh, but anyway, I'm always praying about things that I read about in the paper. So, you think about these things that I have mentioned. Once to be born and once to die. And I hope I have, uh, that I'm going to stay above grass for a while because I feel like I got things to do. I've got to go to Italy pretty soon. And I got to go to the Gathering of Nations in Albuquerque. I got a lot of places I got to go. And I always thank God for taking care of me inside and out and guiding my feet, helping me with words. You know, nudging me when I need to be nudged, you know. So I, I keep my ears and eyes open so that God can help me do whatever I need to do. And I rely on my God a lot. And I hope you do too. And I want to thank each and every one of you. If I said something that bolsters you up and makes you feel good, amen. But then if I could ever talk to you in person, I'd like that too. So take care of yourself. Watch where you go. You've got one time, like I said, to travel this world. So make it good. Be strong. Care. Love. You know, it's a beautiful country. Every time you blink your eyes, you get a different picture. What a camera you got in your eyes. Beauty all around you. And beauty should be inside of you. And I pray that it is. God bless each and every one. And I thank you for listening. Amen. Love you.